So Mark chapter 7, and I start reading from the first verse just so we know exactly where our text has, has come from. If you're using a church Bible, Bible page 997. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who'd come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions such as the washing of cups, pitchers, kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You've let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother. And anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, Whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is Corban. That is a gift devoted to God. Then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull? He asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean? For it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach, and then out of his body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean, for from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. Occasionally in the UK, there's a, a public vote to choose the, the top greatest Britons. And so Margaret Thatcher, Nelson, Cromwell, they always all make the list. Many say they're heroes, but many others say they're villains. Thatcher took jobs from miners. Nelson had a long-term affair. Cromwell's conquest of Ireland cost 200,000 civilian lives. These great Britons are surrounded in controversy. People who don't know Jesus don't think of him as controversial. Their Jesus is soft, woolly, always nice. But what he says here are the most offensive words ever spoken. You forget gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Here is the king of righteousness on mission to save sinners from the horror of hell. Let's pray. Father, as we deal with this difficult text, we're more aware than ever we need Holy Spirit help, assistance from you. So speak to us all. Show us that these aren't just the words of a man, as Dan's just spoken to us. Show us that this truth is coming from you, from your word, not just the inventions, the inventions and vain imaginations of a human being. What human would dare say something as offensive as this? 
But if it is true, I'll make it clear to us. Show us how we need to respond. Speak to us this morning that we'd leave this place knowing that we've dealt with the living God. We pray it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus' words in this passage are as offensive today as when they were first spoken. We can summarize them in two sentences. Number one, being right with God is nothing to do with what you eat. And we're looking then at verse 14 through to verse 19. The religious leaders thought that they pleased God because they never ate the wrong food and they never ate the right food in the wrong way. They wouldn't pick an apple off a tree without having first ceremonially washed their hands. In their thinking, unclean hands made unclean food which went into your body and made an unclean person. And it's not just the Pharisees who think like that. Verse 3, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing. This practice became seared into Jewish culture by two things. P.H. First, past heroes. When Syria conquered Israel, the Syrian king forced the Jews to eat pork. Hundreds of Jews died rather than eat unclean meat. The seven sons of one widow were all killed in front of her. And she stood there and watched as they died, encouraging them to resist. Past heroes, you see how they'd want to be? Like these great heroes of the past, then present humiliation. Now Rome is in charge. And the Jews want to be nothing like the foreign soldiers that walk through their streets and march on a diet of salted pork. So you, you get why these traditions have become so important. It was a, a reflection of their heroes and a reaction to their humiliation. It was ingrained, it was built into the culture. They relied on tradition to separate them, to identify themselves as Israelites and to keep them right with God. And so you also see then how offensive Jesus' words are here. He's saying your scrupulous tradition that you all follow is worthless. What you eat has no effect on your standing with God. Now this is so revolutionary that the disciples didn't get it. They think it's a parable, verse 17. But this is clear, plain teaching. It's not a picture story. Jesus is just saying it how it is. If somebody notices the details and, and grasps a situation quickly, you say, he's got a sharp mind. Well, the disciples are the opposite. The Lord Jesus says, are you so dull? After all you've heard, after everything they've seen, the Sermon on the Mount, Jairus' daughter being raised to life, and yet they still are failing to grasp the gospel. So the Lord Jesus explains again, verse 18, Are you so dull? Don't you see that nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean? For it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach, and then out the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. And so the first application for you this morning then is that there is no list of banned foods in the Christian faith. You are free to eat anything you choose. You can eat any part of an animal, the tail, the tripe, the trotters. It doesn't make you unclean. Japanese Christians aren't defiled when they eat a live octopus. The Maasai aren't unclean when they drink the blood of a cow. When people are lost in mountains for days and become so hungry they eat strips of flesh off dead bodies. Even that doesn't make you unclean. Nothing entering your body through your mouth can make you unclean in God's eyes. Now that's important in a world that's obsessed with eating and diets. If you choose to be a vegetarian, that's your choice. If you choose to follow a specific ethical diet, that's your choice. But you can't call it the Christian way. And you can't force your views on others. Because Jesus said, all foods are clean. Dan and I were at lunch with some friends once and 
we ordered this chicken that was smothered in barbecue sauce and wrapped up in thick, thick bacon. And our friend said grace, and it was a simple grace. I'll always remember it. He said, thank you, Lord, for declaring all foods clean. Amen. <laughs> I told you that these words are hugely controversial, and perhaps you can see how to a, a Muslim or a Jew or a Hindu they would be. But for you, this is great news. <laughs> you can eat what you want. No controversy here. Well, it's controversial because of what Jesus says next. You see, if a little girl asks grandma for a bowl to make mud pies in, she doesn't open the top cupboard and get out the Royal Dalton, does she? She gives her a plant pot or a bowl that's already ruined and this is why food is inconsequential even if it had potential to make us unclean even if it could ruin us it wouldn't matter because we're already ruined Jesus says we're already there we're already spoiled already defiled just when pleasing God seemed possible Christ shows us it's harder than we ever imagined being right with God is not about what we eat being right with God is about who we are. Looking now at the rest of this passage, verse 20 to 23, Jesus spells it out to the disciples. God's not interested in what's in your stomach. He's interested in what's in your heart. You know that the heart represents who we are. It represents the whole person, soul, mind, spirit, emotions. That's what we mean when we talk about the heart of a person, isn't it? That's what God will examine when he judges us. He will search it out completely, every facet, every part of our character, of our person. God will examine. Does that make you uncomfortable? It should. If it doesn't make you uncomfortable, are you like the disciples? Are you dull? Have you come to church for years and never realized that it's deeper than what you say and what you do? Pay attention now to what God the Son says about your heart. Verse 20, he went on, What comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. You see, it's not just the disciples' heart. Jesus doesn't say your hearts. He says men's hearts. What comes out of a man? This is a universal problem. This is your problem. And this is my problem. All the sins that we commit come from inside. We are the source. And so now you see how controversial this is. Sin scuttles around our lives like cockroaches, but the nest is our heart. Jesus lists 13 sins, all born in the heart. The first seven are actions. Number one is evil thought. Selfish, violent, sexual thoughts. They seem so victimless, don't they? They don't hurt anybody what goes on in my head, but it's an abuse of the mind that God has given you, and he will hold you accountable. Number two, sexual immorality. That's the word that we get the word pornography from. Our world has drowned itself in pornography. The most perverse fantasies are a click away. Millions of men and women are gripped in a spiral of pleasure-seeking, emptiness and then self-hatred they know it's wrong but they can't get out they can't kill the thirst that is in their heart third is theft thieves even operate in sleepy southland they steal vehicles from garages purses from handbags movies and games from the internet maybe a look at somebody else's wife fourth is murder there's a poison ivy plant shooting up in your garden, so you, you pull it out right away. It's not fully grown, but it's still a problem, and it will become a much bigger one. You might not think we're capable of murder, <coughs> but Jesus said hatred for another person is as good as murder in God's eyes. 
Have you ever hated anyone? Anger might only be the seed of murder, but it's still in our hearts. The potential is still there. Fifth is adultery. The specific breaking then of marriage vows. Affairs have become an industry. There are websites that can set one up for you. How has that happened? How have we gone in 50 years from marriage being sacred to marriage being a joke? Well, men and women's hearts have been left to run free. Sixth is greed, that overwhelming desire for more and a lack of contentment with what you have. It's, it's like a pus oozing from a self-loving heart. Seventh is malice, and that means a desire to do wrong, to just bend or, or break the rules because you get a bit of a kick out of it. Seven, evil action <coughs> that spill out from our hearts, but it doesn't stop there. You see, God's justice is like a steamroller. And his examination of who we are is relentless. And after these seven sinful actions come six sinful attitudes. Attitudes! God will judge those too. And so we're made even more uncomfortable. The first is deceit. One deceiver imitates a teenager online so he can influence young girls. Another deceiver twists the truth and tells tales so that they always look good in conversation. The second is lewdness. It's an old-fashioned word for, for rudeness. You see it in TV shows obsessed with sexual innuendo, in the jokes that men tell each other in the pub, in the magazines that ladies read. Third is envy. Wanting what another person has so much that it ruins your relationship. You can't take any joy or pleasure in another person's success. That should be my house, my car, my farm, family, business. It comes out, of, it comes out in, in gossip and favoritism and, and resentful glances. But it all starts in the heart. Fourth is slander. Putting others down to make yourself look better. Fifth is arrogance. An arrogant person always sees themselves as better than everyone else. When someone outstrips you intellectually, well, you're better at sports than they are, so don't worry about it. Arrogance always finds a way to look good. Sixth is folly. A celebrity is arrested on drugs charges, and we all say, how could they let that happen? They've got everything. How could they be so stupid? What went wrong? Well, they have the same heart that you do. All folly begins in the human heart. It spews out and makes heroes and good-looking men and women utterly unclean. So this is God's controversial diagnosis for each one of us. The sins of your whole life. Sins that will bar you from heaven and burn you in hell all come from your own heart. Now when the doctor gives bad news, there are two questions we ask. What does it mean? How is this going to affect my life? Three things. Number one, you're totally corrupt. There's an American family whose water came from a well in their back garden and they started noticing a strange taste and smell. And the police later discovered that a neighbor had murdered his girlfriend and dumped the body in the well. How much of the water was contaminated? Was there a clean cup anywhere in the well? No. Our hearts are like a bloated, rotting corpse in the well of who we are. How much of us is contaminated? Every part. We can get worse if that corpse is allowed to to stay there, to linger, to fester. We could commit much worse sins, but it doesn't matter because we're already totally corrupt. Every cup of water we bring from the well is tainted. Our actions and attitudes flow from a poisoned source. Secondly, you're totally responsible. And this is the hardest thing about what Jesus is saying. The hardest bit to accept 
because we want to believe with every ounce of who we are that really we're good people. And the things that we do wrong, well, they're just mistakes. Deep down, we're innocent. And we can wish that with everything that we are. But Jesus is saying it's nonsense. God sees you for what you really are. He sees the seething mess of sin that your heart is. And you can point your finger at your circumstances and say, I'm a victim. But God, whose finger counts, points back at you and says, no, you're responsible. It's your heart. And you will pay for your sin. And thirdly, totally lost. See, Romans 2.16 says a day is coming when God will judge the secrets of men's hearts, the things that nobody else sees, that nobody in this room knows about, not even your wife or your husband. Every detail of our shame, every wicked thought, action, attitude will be judged by God. Does that make you shudder? Now that you see what your heart looks like to a holy God, aren't you squirming in your seat? Do you see how hopeless you are before the judge? A criminal sweats as he sees the evidence mounting up against him and he starts to count the years he'll be serving. Five, ten, twenty years. When God judges us and all those open sins and secret sins come spilling out everywhere and the evidence mounts up and up and up, what hope will there be then for you of heaven? None. God will send every sinner to hell, not for 20 years, but eternity. The second question we ask is, well, what then must I do? If the doctor says diabetes, there's much to do. There's diet and exercise and insulin injections. But what can we do about our sinful hearts? We can't make up for them by doing good. You know that? We can't fix the problem by trying to change ourselves, by trying to be good people. Our best efforts are tainted by the corpse in the well. The best thing that we can bring out of ourselves is filthy water. Our best efforts are going to be tainted with the smell and the taste of death. We're totally corrupt, responsible and lost. And so we are totally dependent on something outside of ourselves. We are totally dependent on God. You see, we can do nothing but Jesus. My Lord Jesus has done everything. Your life isn't worthy of heaven. But Jesus' life was perfect. He never broke God's law. Always obeyed him. You deserve death and hell for that rotten heart. Jesus deserves life and heaven. But he willingly died on the cross and suffered hell in place of anyone who will believe on him. Jesus Christ took your rotten heart in all of its filth and showed it to God and said, this is me. He presented it to God as his own, offered it to God as his, and God crushed him as if he was the sinner. He judged Jesus like the pervert, the thief, the murderer, the gossip, the liar, the fool that you have been. Christ took your judgment and offers you forgiveness. He took your heart and offers you a new heart. Even his own heart that's free from sin and shame. You can't help yourself. But Christ can. So you pray to him. You beg him to take your heart and give you his. You repent of your sin. You turn from yourself and the way you've been living. It's time for total change. A new heart. A new life. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We read earlier a little section from Psalm 51. You know King David was a wicked sinner. He had a heart just like me and you. And from that heart came lust. And that lust led to envy, then theft, then adultery, and murder, and deceit. 
but God showed him his sin and he broke his heart has he done that for you this morning has she shown you how empty how fruitless how useless we are left to ourselves can you repent like David did remember reading that quote somewhere many people have sinned like David but very few repented like David could you repent like him this morning turn from yourself throw yourself on God's mercy pray David's prayer hide your face from my sins blot out all my iniquity create in me a clean heart ah. some of my Christian friends here this morning are looking a little bit battered and bruised <laughs> by what we've read this morning you should be thrilled that all of this has fallen on the Lord Jesus all of that rottenness all of that weakness and sin and shame was placed on the Son of God that he bore it all for you that God doesn't count one sin one failing of that weak heart against you anymore all is forgiven Jesus paid it all let's pray Father, we marvel at the grace that takes a wretched heart like mine, nails it to the cross, says all of these sins, all of these failings that should keep me in hell for all eternity are paid in full in the death of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus that you would suffer God's wrath for me. Praise you, Lord Jesus, that you rose from the dead. And so this offer of new life in you is ratified and confirmed by an empty tomb. That the door is open to anybody this morning who would turn from self, turn to Christ. I pray, Holy Spirit, you'd move in hearts, change hearts, save lives, even now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, God.